بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا جاءت الأمة وعبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز معكم فوزا عظيما قال الله في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها إن بعث أشقاها فقال لهم رسول الله ناقة الله وسقياها فكذبوه فعقروها فدمدم عليهم ربهم بذنبهم فسواها ولا يخاف عقباها Sweeten and revive your gatherings with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad The second salawat for the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi Fatima sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad For the love of Ali al-Akbar, the son of Imam Hussein, the martyr of tonight, the third with the loudest of your voices. Islamophobia, the prejudice, the hatred, the racism directed towards Islam and Muslims is not a new phenomena but has existed in the English language for the past century. Oxford English Dictionary places this word at the age, at the year 1923 as a term and as a word for Americans or the English speaking brothers and sisters to use as a terminology and it defines it as extreme hatred and dislike towards Islam and Muslims, one, or extreme fear of Islam and Muslims. So if you are an extreme fear of Islam and Muslims, you are practicing or a subject of Islamophobia, or if you have extreme hate or dislike towards Muslims, you are also practicing Islamophobia. This is not a new phenomenon. This did not appear and surface in the year 2015 or 2016. And now today we see politicians and people and anchors on television channels or writers in newspaper use this terminology. It is not all of a sudden that politicians and presidents to become use the word radical Islam or radical Muslims. 
and try to express their feeling by using this word Islamophobia. It has existed in the English language for the past century and people have expressed their feelings with this word and terminology since 1923. What is the cause? What are the reasons that this word and terminology starts to surface once again and bigotry and hatred is directed and pointed towards Islam and Muslims through the ages and through the generations? There are three reasons, one of them being that those who carry hate towards Islam and Muslims work day and night to destroy and tarnish the image of Islam and Muslims. So the world can see us as barbarian, sexist individuals who do not show respect to their women, to their fathers, to their children. They are murderers, robbers, and everything that you could imagine to destroy someone's character, to destroy and tarnish someone's values or their picture or their characteristics. So no one around the world can no longer respect or honor this religion or the people who follow this religion. They spend millions and millions of dollars annually and around the globe to destroy the religion of Islam and to destroy the image of the Muslims. They give millions of dollars to news agencies, newspapers, magazines, television stations, billboards, ads all around the world so people can grow with this factor. Islamophobia, fearing Muslims or hating Muslims. People like John Richardson make a study about this phenomena. They say that 85, he says that 85% of mainstream media today try to convey one message. And that message is that Mus Muslims and Islam and their existence is a threat to mankind and humanity. That as long as Muslims exist and as long as the religion of Islam exists, humanity and planet Earth is under a threat. Their business are under threat. Their lives are under a threat. Their children are under a threat. This world and the existence of man is under a threat as long as Muslims and Islam is being practiced. This is what mainstream media, mainstream newspapers try to convey around the world. Whether it's New York Times or the Los Angeles Times or CNN or NBC or, or BBC, it doesn't matter. These mainstream channels, mainstream media, mainstream news that people listen to and watch globally only try to convey this message that as long as Muslims exist and as long as Islam is being practiced the existence of man is in danger thus you should live in fear as people who do not practice Islam Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, you're all in danger as long as Muslims exist and live amongst you. They are the cells that can, they're the cancer cells of society that can attack the body of society and the body of a country at any moment and have that country or society collapse. Organizations that thrive through hate and prejudice and racism, like Stop Islamization of America, spend millions of dollars annual, annually in America and around the globe. In 2012, they bought hundreds of billboards in New York City and all around America to portray one image about Muslims. There's a Muslim man with a beard and he's wearing a vest filled with explosives. And they write the real Islam, hashtag real Islam. 
They show ISIS members beheading innocent lives and they write hashtag the real Islam. Hundreds of billboards around the world in New York City, the Big Apple, where it matters, where it counts, where influence happens. They're paying millions of dollars to destroy my image, to tarnish my image and your image, brothers and sisters, and the religion, the beautiful religion that we follow. <coughs> they purchased 228 advertisements around every clock in the city of New York. So every time a New Yorker was going around the city, and he wanted to see what time it is and he looked up at the clock, he saw a picture of a Muslim man and it had a defaming message, a connotation to it. So automatically without him realizing, he will start to practice Islamophobia and he will carry the factors and ingredients of Islamophobia of showing extreme hatred, intense hatred and dislike towards Muslims. This is why we see in one of Donald Trump's videos that were leaked, a woman stands up in one of his, in one of his sermons and she says, we want to get rid of these hijabis. They're working in the TSA, they're working everywhere. And he turns around and he tells, yes, we are looking into that as if this is the most important thing that he needs to look at because there are Muslim women and the working in environments, working in the airports and working in the United States of America or the United Kingdom or Canada or New Zealand or Australia. They see us as a threat because they convey us as a threat. They want the world to see us as a threat. But who was ISIS created by? ISIS was not created by the Muslims. If you ask the Muslims, do you partake or show any love and affection for the ISIS members? They will tell you ISIS is not of Islam and they are not Muslims. They're nowhere close to Islam. They portray images of the September 11th attacks on the city of New York that hit the Twin Towers and they say this is the real Islam. But what I recall is, and I want to tell the Western media and the West in general and these societies that, is, that it was not Islam that made an ally with Saudi Arabia and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, with the household of Al Saud. The United States was attacked by their own allies that they are feeding billions and billions of petrol dollars. They were your allies. King Abdullah was your ally and every single person in that attack on the nation of the United States of America was a Saudi citizen. So why do the Muslims need to see all the hardship and disasters? They enter Iraq to fight terrorism. They enter Afghanistan to fight terrorism. Pakistan to fight terrorism. Yemen to fight terrorism. When the people who attacked you were the household of Saudi Arabia, the royal family of Al Saud, to a point that you still decide to protect till today after even WikiLeaks and information was leaked that those who attacked and destroyed the Twin Towers and had innocent lives, innocent American lives taken were from Saudi Arabia and funded by the royal Saudi family. And funded by the Saudi royal family. So why tarnish my image? Why tarnish the image of Islam, the religion of peace? But this is what they live for. This is their number one task. And they work hard every day and night to destroy this religion. One, because since the day of its existence, it has been the fastest growing religion on this earth, whether the people of Quraysh liked it or not. Whether 
Every single president around the world likes it or not. Islam is the largest growing religion and the fastest growing religion around the world. So to them, this is a way to put a stop to the growth of Islam, to the growth of the religion of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. They're working day and night to destroy our image. This is why Islamophobia exists. This is why you see it on television, you see it in the newspapers, you see it everywhere. This is why we are living in such an atmosphere that our women fear to wear for, for, for their scarves, our men fear to have their beards so they can have employed, employment and have a job. This is the reason because there are people who are working day and night to tarnish what we represent and whom we actually are to change that image. Those created by the United States of America are the ones who attacked the shores of America. They weren't normal Muslims going to work, praying five times a day, no. They were the people that you created in Afghanistan to destroy the Soviet Union. You gave them the power, you gave them the weapons, you gave them everything, you gave them the funding and years passed by and that monster that you created, that Frankenstein that you created came back to harm you and to destroy you and attack you and bite the hand it fed. Why? So they can have billions of dollars of heroin money taken around the world. So the Taliban could harvest their poppy plantations and countries like America, Canada, Mexico and all around the world there is drug abuse and heroin intake from all around the world. And who gets the money? The United States of America. These are not facts that are hidden in dungeons or or places where people cannot find. This information is on the internet and out everywhere. Everyone in the world knows this information, but they do nothing about it. Why? Because we as Muslims, we allow them to tarnish and destroy our image. We allow them to show us as barbarians on television and in newspapers. They're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a post in the New York Times this, against Islam, against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or having cartoons like the Charlie Hebdo cartoon. They're funding these organizations. But we as Muslims, what have we done to remove the thought of Islamophobia within these societies. Have we had our answer and return into what these people are doing and trying to convey the whole world as Muslims? Did we buy billboards in the city of New York and the Big Apple? Did we try to buy billboards and have advertisements in the city of New Zealand or the country of Australia or the United States or Canada? Have we bought one billboard? Have we funded and given money to movie production companies to make movies that have a friendly image of Muslims? But every time you go to the movies and you watch a movie, Every time the bad guy is the Muslim, the guy that's going to kill someone is the Muslim. Every time there's someone about to kill himself or commit suicide, he's a Muslim. They're paying money for that. They're paying money for that. But we as Muslims, are we also contributing on our behalf, on the behalf of our communities, on the behalf of our religion, to show a better picture of our brothers and sisters who cannot harm a fly. So this is the second reason why Islamophobia exists today and has existed since 1923. And it goes and it comes back. And this is why people like Donald Trump 
and politicians in the United States and around the world have the audacity to call our religion an extremist religion. Because there is no one to tell them to be quiet and respect himself. Why isn't there a person stating the same statements about Judaism who has been or Zionist, the, the, the Zionist regime who has been killing Palestinians for the past decade or five or six decades, destroying Palestinian homes and killing innocent lives, taking in innocent lives? How come it's not portrayed? about a whole religion because one person commits a mistake. This religion has 1.5 billion followers. If 10 or 13 individuals commit a mistake or commit a crime, this means the whole religion is made up of, of murderers or killers? No, this is not how things work, but this is how they convey it because you and I have done nothing about it. Did we write in any newspapers? Did we, did we write to any anchors that host television shows and news channels? Did we write to them? Did we try to get on television? Did we try to write in the newspapers? No, we didn't. We are sitting at home and we are doing nothing about it. When Abraham went to Mecca as the king of Yemen to destroy the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people of Mecca sat there. They said, the army of Abraham is too large, too powerful for us to stop. He's let him destroy the Kaaba and the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A place of worship for all the sons of Abraham and all Abrahamic religions. What people don't know is that the Jews and the Christians also used to go to the city of Mecca and pay homage and respect and make tawaf around the Kaaba. Until the religion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi appeared and jealousy also appeared. So Abraham, the king of Yemen, marches towards Mecca to destroy the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a great and vast and powerful army. But Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, goes and stands before the Kaaba. He stands before the army of Abraham. He stands before the swords and the spears in protecting the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we go and stand in front of these people to protect our religion? Do we live by the teachings of the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Abdul Muttalib? And it was because of his prayers, because of his bravery, because of his courageousness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the Kaaba and he revealed Surah Al-Feel. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ Don't you recall what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did to the people of Feel who came to destroy the Kaaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still needs our help. He needs to see that at least one of us cares about the religion, cares about the picture and the image of Islam and all Muslims. If we are all sitting at home and we're stagnant and we're not making any moves, we're being checkmated every single moment of our lives. This is why Muslims are so weak around the world. Saudi Arabia bombs with U.S. coalitions on a majlis, a Husseini majlis in the city of Yemen. Innocent lives were taken, infants were killed. But the me media and the news does not portray it. Does not portray it. Why? Because you and I have done nothing about it. And the third, because Islam is the fastest growing religion. They can't see that Islam is growing, flourishing. There are people who are not from Iran or Iraq or Pakistan entering the religion of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The country of Indonesia never saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi 
or his companions. But now today they are the largest Muslim country. People who are entering the religion of Islam in America, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, in New Zealand, never saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. But they fell in love with his words, with his lifestyle, by his ways of peace and love and passion. This is why they're entering Islam. So to stop this wave of Muslims growing and Islam flourishing, let us destroy the image of Islam so less people enter this religion. So how long has Islamophobia existed? Is it just one century? Is this new? Is, has it only been since 1923 that people are actually teaching to hate Muslims, to show dislike towards Muslims, or has it existed longer than that? Islamophobia existed with the existence of Islam. As soon as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi came with the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his uncle Abu Sufyan would mock him. And the hadith of Al-Dar, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa andar, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He made a feast for his family members, for the people of Mecca. He invited them to his house. Then he told them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set him as a messenger. The only person to stand up and believe him was Ali ibn Abi Talib. All the other members, all the clan members mocked him and ridiculed him. And from that day point, from that point forward, they became his enemies. They started to preach hate and envy and prejudice and racism against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. It existed with Hind, it existed with Abu Lahab, it existed with Abu Jahl, it existed with Utbah, and it existed with the forefathers and the leaders of Quraysh. How much they spent and how many wars they waged against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Almost 81 battles that Rasulullah had to stand in, most of them were waged by Sanadid al-Quraysh and the fathers of Quraysh and the leaders of Quraysh to extinguish the light of Islam and the flourishment of Islam, fearing that their children, their sons and daughters and wives and husbands will revert back to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would pay the children in the city of Mecca to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and to stone him. To a point that Rasulullah would start bleeding. One day they broke his, his forehead. One day they broke his teeth. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this name to Fatima, Ummu Abiha. Because she was the only one to sit there and to remove the blood stains from the face of Rasulullah and from the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He had no supporters except his daughter, except his cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib, his uncle Abu Talib. That's it, but he stood firm. He stood firm to spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would throw thorn, thorns in his pathway, so when he would walk in the streets of Mecca, the thorns would enter his feet, and his feet would start bleeding. They would bring hatab wood, and make fires and set fires in his pathway. So Rasulullah leaves this religion. He does not preach of this religion. But the Prophet never stopped. Abu Lahab, his own uncle and his wife would bring fire and put it in the, in the pathway of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tab. Ma agna anhu ma luhu wa ma kasab. Sayasla naran that hatab. سَيَسْلَى نَارًا ذَاتَ لَهَبْ وَمْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبِ Him and his wife would go give the kids money, go hit Rasulullah. Go put this fire in the path of Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi would not say anything to them. He would turn around and go away. He would forgive them. He would show them pardon. 
When he was praying, they would go and bring najasat and the intestines of their cows, their sheep, and they would throw it on the head of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they would tell everyone to show hate towards Rasulullah. When they saw Rasulullah teaching and reciting the Quran, they would come and tell the people to place your hands in your ears so you don't hear of the words of Muhammad. He's a magician, he's a liar. They saw that nothing worked. Killing his uncle Hamza didn't work. Killing his companions did not work. Killing Ammar ibn Yasir's parents did not work. They came trying to bribe him. We will give you all the wealth of Mecca. You will become the wealthiest man in the city of Mecca. We, any woman that you want, we will make her your wife. They tried to seduce him. They tried to have him leave this religion. But he tells them, Wallah, if they gave me the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I will not leave the religion of, Rasul, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if I am alone, even there, if there is no one with me. Do we learn from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Are we fighting Islamophobia today? Like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi fought Islamophobia 14 centuries ago with the people of Quraysh? Even if he was alone, he still practiced his religion. For five years, only Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi would conduct his prayers and Amir al-Mu'mineen would stand to his right and Khadija to his left. For five years, no one else. No one else. They would go stand by the Kaaba and Masjid al-Haram and they're the only three praying for, for five consecutive years. They exile Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to Shi'b Abi Talib, to the narrow path of Abu Talib and every day Abu Talib and Amir al-Mu'mineen change, would change the bed of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because Quraysh would pay assassins to come and kill Rasulullah to a point that he could not go get his food or his water from the city of Mecca. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib would have to go bring them food for all Bani Hashim, for all of Bani Hashim, all of Bani Hashim the trade was closed off of them. No one would give them food. No one would give them water because they protected Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Is it this Islamophobia? Back then there was not newspapers, there weren't TV channels. But they use this type of propaganda to destroy and tarnish the image of Rasulullah and the image of Islam. But Rasulullah stood fast and he stood strong and he dealt with them with his akhlaq, his marital character. This is what spread the religion of Islam. This is what spread the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Love, compassion, Mercy, this is why 1.5 billion Muslims or human beings follow the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He made it clear that without love and compassion, a person cannot enter paradise. A Muslim cannot enter paradise. Without love and mercy and compassion, your prayers, your fasting is valueless and holds no point or value. This is the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The Prophet says, أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلَقًا The best of believers and the best of mu'mineen is the one with the most complete characteristics. He's the most noble, he's the most honored one of you. It's not the one who's making tasbih and always holding the subha and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but when someone comes and speaks to him, he yells in his face. He's always frowning in the face of his brothers and sisters. He's always backbiting or making them iman, instigating. No, he's the one with the best of akhlaq, the best of morality, the one that shows the most love, the one that shows the most respect, the one that shows the most compassion, he is the one 
that has the most complete religion and the most complete faith and iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The leading reasons why people enter paradise, Muslims or non-Muslims, is fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from sin than marital characters. On the day of judgment, the people who enter paradise and most people who enter paradise is based on their akhlaq, based on their character. If they showed respect to their mothers, fathers, their elderly, they showed respect to non-Muslims and Muslims alike. Akhlaq is the most important thing when it comes to the religion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He's not saying that you're going to enter paradise for other things. He's saying that because of your character and because of your akhlaq, you will enter paradise. Because of your akhlaq, because of your character, you will complete your iman. And he says, A servant with his beautiful characteristics and nobility can reach the position of a person who spends all his nights and his days in prayer. A abid, abid who's constantly in prayer. And a person who's always fasting. You can earn, earn the same thawab. You can earn the same deeds by just having good manners with people. Having good manners with your boss, with your co-workers, with those individuals that you partake in and encounter on daily basis. So they can look at you and they say, these are the true followers of Muhammad. These are the true values of Islam. These are the true teachings of Islam and the values of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way we end Islamophobia, brothers and sisters. This is the way we put an end to Islamophobia. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This is the core of our religion. This is the foundations of our religion. A man comes to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. He tells him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, what is the religion? What are the main ingredients and components of the religion of your grandfather? Or any religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent upon mankind. Imam al-Sadiq says, Hal al-deen illa al-hub? That religion is nothing but love. Religion is nothing but love. Showing love for your parents, showing love for your family members, showing love to your brothers in Islam, showing love to your brothers in creation. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says that every single human being is either your brother based on religion or he is also still the son of Adam and he is your brother through creation. Show love to everyone. This is the religion of Rasulullah. This is the religion and the madhab of Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq. How do these governments today deal with criminals? If a person is a murderer, if a person has a, a robbed someone, he raped someone, how do these governments deal with him? There is severe punishment, isn't there? There is, for some, there is the death penalty. If you're a killer and a murderer in some countries, till today, there is the death penalty. But how did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi deal with the people of Mecca who killed his companions, who killed his loved ones, who killed the closest of his uncles, Hamza? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi enters the city of Mecca as a conquest to conquer the city of Mecca, when they were entering the city of Mecca, Rasulullah told the army of the Muslims to walk on their tippy toes. So the people of Mecca, they don't hear the noises of the armor and the swords and the spears. Walk on your tippy toes, 
take off your boots and enter the city of Mecca so the people of Mecca do not go in chaos. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. They start marching towards the city of Mecca. One of the soldiers, he holds the flag of the Muslims and he starts to call al yawm yawm al malhama Today is the day of annihilation. Rasulullah pushes Amir al muminin He tells him, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib, go take the flag from this soldier who does not know what he's saying. These are not the teachings of Islam. Amir al muminin goes and takes the flag and he bears the flag of Islam and he says, Al yawm yawm al marhama Today is the, the day of mercy. Today is the day of salvation. And this is when Rasul, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. They started entering the religion of Rasulullah and the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the flocks, by the hundreds and by the thousands because they saw the mercy of Rasulullah. Wahshi is standing before Rasulullah. Hind is standing before Rasulullah. Hind, the person that ordered Hamsh, Wahshi to kill the uncle of Rasulullah. And then she went, removed every single one of his fingers, his toes, his nose, and she made a necklace out of it. She ate his liver, she ate his heart. And when they are standing now before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Prophet says, what do you see me doing to you guys? As a punishment or anything, as a result of what you treated me and how you treated me for the past 20 years. They say, Kareem wa ibn akhin Kareem. You are a generous man, a son of a generous man. The Prophet says, فَذْهَبُوا فَأَنْتُمُ الطَّلَقَاتِ Go, you are free men. This is Rasulullah. Do not Muslims know of these stories? Do not Muslims know the compassion and the mercy and the pardon of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, even amongst those people who killed his folks and killed his kin and his family members? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi shows them pardon. Historians say that there was an old lady in the city of Mecca, she was a mushrik and she hated Rasulullah. Everywhere she would go, she would tell the youth, beware of Muhammad ibn Abdullah, he's a sorcerer. One day the, pro the Prophet sees her, one day the Prophet sees her trying to carry logs and wood and you know, what she has purchased from the bazaar back to her house, but she's an old lady. She can't carry everything. It's in the middle of Dhuhr time, in the noon, it's hot. There's no one helping her. The Prophet leaves his people, his companions. He goes and he carries the heavy load on his shoulders and he walks with her to the house, to her house, even though that her house was very far from the house of Rasulullah. The whole time, this lady is nagging about Muhammad ibn Abdullah. God curse him. May the gods curse him. This person came to deviate our kids, our youth, our people, until she reaches her house. She tells him, well, I don't have any money to give you, but I pray that you will never stumble upon Muhammad because he is, removed, he is teaching our children the wrong path. He puts everything down. He tells her, what if this man that's helped you today, he is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. She turns to him with all shock and she tells him, well, are you? He says, yes, I am Muhammad. And that's when he, she takes her shahada of ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. This is how the religion of Islam spread. And this is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi dealt with Islamophobia. He was the most easygoing, most pure. He tells his companions, I don't want any of you to come and tell me of the wrongdoings of their brothers and sisters. 
Have you seen when the Maulana enters the masjid, everyone wants to come and complain about this guy did that, this guy broke this, this guy went and said that, this lady said that, her kids broke that. Rasulullah tells the companions and the Muslims, please keep everything to yourself. Don't tell me anything about your brothers and sisters so I can come to you with a clean heart. I can show every single one of you love and compassion. He had the most purest of hearts. He was the most pure man to live upon this earth. And this is why people followed him. This is why people followed him. Rasulullah did not see himself to be over other individuals. Sometimes we see if a person becomes a physician or a doctor or a high ranking Mawlana, he no longer wants to sit with the average folks. He sees them to be lower than him. If he's very successful, he's a millionaire, he's, he's very rich, he no longer wants to sit with the poor, he no longer wants to sit with the average folks. But Rasulullah sat with all of his companions, he sat with the weakest of his companions, with the poorest of his companions, and he was pleasant with his companions. He didn't just sit and frown at everyone that sat in front of him. No, he would smile and laugh and actually make jokes with his companions. If he saw that one of the companions was feeling down, he would have pleasantry with him until he smiled and his day changed. These are the reasons why people followed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And he would tell the Muslims, Inna Allah yabghul al-mu'abbisa fi wajhi ikhwanih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes and hates the person who frowns in the face of his brothers and sisters. Whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, to keep a smile. This is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi dealt with the people of Quraysh and with Islamophobia. These are the ways that we need to deal with our friends, with our peers, with our schoolmates, with our colleagues. Through the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And on the 10th of Muharram when Ali al-Akbar came out of the tent, Imam Hussein looked towards the sky and he said, Oh Allah, be a witness that a man has walked towards them, being the most similar to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in his looks and his character. Allahumma shahad ala haula il qawm. قد برز إليهم غلام أشبه الناس خلقا وخلقا ومنطقا برسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وإذا اشتقنا للرؤية رسول الله نظرنا لوجه هذا الغلام Oh Allah be a witness that Ali al-Akbar is the person with the most similarities to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi when it comes to his looks or his character or the way he talked. And if we would miss Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the company of Rasulullah, we would sit around Ali al-Akbar and we would look at the beautiful face of Ali al-Akbar. Now Ali al-Akbar is coming, the oldest son to Imam Hussein is coming to him and tell, asking him to give him permission to go and fight the enemies. Can you imagine as a mother or a father, brothers and sisters? I hope there are no mothers and fathers who have lost their sons or daughters. But I've never stood at the grave of their sons and daughters. But Imam Hussein had to stand on the grave of Ali al -Akbar. Numerous times Ali al-Akbar comes and asks for permission. It is so hard for Imam Hussein as a father to say yes to his son. Every time he tries to change the subject. Oh my son, wait some more. Oh my son, go to your mother's tent. 
until he tells him, Ya Ali, Ya Ali, I see that you are persistent. You want to go towards Shahada. He tells him, Yes, my father, I can no longer see these evil men surround you. I can no longer withstand this dunya and its hardship. Imam Hussein tells him, Then come here, let me hug you and hold you one last time. Ali al Akbar comes towards his father. Historians say that Imam Hussein placed his hands around the neck of Ali al Akbar and he started to, to smell the scent of Ali al Akbar from his neck. This is the last time I will hold my son. All those years of hardship and raising him, this is the last time, this is the farewell. Historians say that him and his father cried and cried and wept until they fell to the ground. And then they stood firmly and Ali al-Akbar mounted his horse. Imam Hussein gave him his amama, he gave him his helmet and he told him, ride my son. Ride towards your eternal glory. Ali al-Akbar rides towards the enemies. The enemies of Imam Hussein started to shout, This is Rasulullah. He has come to fight us. We are doomed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send his punishment. This is Muhammad. He has rose from the dead. But he responds, No, oh, I am not Muhammad. I am Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali. I am Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali. I am here to defend the household of Rasulullah. He fights them courageously. The first time he goes down to the battlefield, he takes the lives of 180 of the enemies of Imam Hussein. This is the son of this is the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the line of God. Until he stands in the middle of the battleground, no one wants to come forward. No one wants to fight this, the grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He turns around. At this moment, his mother Layla is looking from the tent, she is looking at the face of Imam Hussein. She sees one second Imam Hussein is smiling, one second Imam Hussein, he is worried, he starts to sweat, and he starts to say, La ilaha illallah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. She tells him, oh, oh my Imam, what's going on? What, did, did Ali al Akbar fall? He tells her, no, Layla, go and pray for the return of your son. She goes into the tent. She sits on her sajada. She starts to pray towards Allah. Oh Allah, that returned Yusuf to the crying eyes of Yaqub. Return my son safe and sound. Ali al-Akbar at that moment returns to the camp of Imam Hussein and he tells him, oh my father, the weight of this hadith, this armor has drained me. The scorching sun has made me thirsty. Oh, my father, if you have some water, give me a drink so I can gain some energy to go and fight the enemies. Imam Hussein turns to him and tells him, Oh, my son, Ali al Akbar, come here, come closer to me. I want you to look at my, my tongue. Ali al-Akbar, as soon as he saw the tongue of Imam Hussein, he started to cry and weep. Oh, my father, you seem to be more thirsty than me. <laughs> he tells him, oh, my son, my mother, the woman, they want to see you one last time. <laughs> go, go to the tent of your, your mother, to the tent of the woman, Ali al-Akbar enters the tent of the woman. His mother tells him, Oh my son, I want you just to walk in front of me. I want to see you walk in front of me. I want to see this beauty one last time. <laughs> and then he goes back, mounts his horse, and he rides towards the enemies. As he is fighting courageously, 
One of the enemies of Imam Hussein comes with a very long spear and pierces the kidneys of Ali al-Akbar. Ali al-Akbar is almost unmounted from his horse. Another enemy hits him on his head. His head starts to bleed and the blood starts to gush on the eyes of the horse. The horse, instead of taking him back towards his father, he takes him to the middle of the enemies. Then the historians say, وَقَدْ قَطَّعُوهُ إِرْبًا إِرْبًا They cut Ali al-Akbar into pieces. He calls upon his father, يَا أَبَتَا هذا جدي قد سقاني من كأسه الأوفا. This is my grandfather giving me water from the hole of Kalthar. Imam Hussein runs towards his child. He runs towards his child. He sees Ali Al Akbar with no helmet. He has fallen. <laughs> He has fallen to the ground. He is taking his last breaths. He tries to carry Ali Al Akbar back to the tent, but every time he tries to carry Ali Al Akbar, one of his body parts fall to the ground. He tries to carry him from this, the upper portion of his body. The bottom part falls down until he takes off his Aba. He tries to carry his son with his Aba and he could still not carry his son. He calls, Ya Abna, Ya Abna Akhi. Oh, my nephews, come and carry your cousin. He is torn into pieces. <laughs> <laughs> you wish that one day when you depart this world that your, ch your sons or daughters will be sitting at your graves. They will be commemorating your death. They will be carrying your casket. But Imam Hussein had to sit on the grave of his son. He had to carry the corpse of his son. Thank <laughs> you.